So why did I decide to make this thing? Well, first, I was bored, and I just wanted to see if I could do it. You know, slap some pieces of plywood together, uh, cut a hole for a speaker, uh, screw it in, put, put some wires leading out the back, plug it into an amplifier. Sounds easy, right? Well, the construction part actually was pretty easy, but it wasn't something that I just, you know, threw together in a couple hours. You know, there was actual planning involved with this thing. I drew out a design in Inventor, which is a piece of software that I'm learning how to use for work. I dimensioned everything. I made a budget for materials. I went to Lowe's and I bought the materials. I ordered some electronics from DigiKey. Since it's a one by 12, I only needed the one quarter inch input jack and I have the other one still in a bag right here. Maybe I'll make a two by 12 someday or a 4x12 and I can use this other jack somehow. Or maybe the other one will go bad and I can still use it. I'm keeping it around. And speaking of getting materials, reason number two that I wanted to do this is because I just wanted to see how much it would cost money-wise to make one of these things on my own because uh, cabinets are pretty expensive. A mini Mesa rectifier cab, uh, 1x12 with just a single vintage 30 in it, uh, will run you over 500 bucks, I think. And if you're in America, and you want a Marshall 4x12, you're going to be shelling out close to $2,000. Well, as it turns out, the cost of everything wasn't too bad, actually. I think I paid $15 altogether, or thereabouts, for the parts from DigiKey and the shipping. Three-quarter inch plywood that I bought to make the cabinet out of was $50 for a four-foot by eight-foot sheet. The machine screws and the T-nuts that I used to mount the speaker were probably less than $10 uh, tacked onto that 50 the speaker wire I clipped from a set of old hi-fi speakers that I have lying around. Can it handle the sound of a 120 watt tube head being run through it? Time will tell. So the speaker wire was free, and the speaker itself was also free because I have a pretty sizable collection of speakers lying around, mostly vintage 30s, you know, I really want to broaden my speaker horizons. I've got a couple of anomalies among my collection though, you know, I've got that Celestian Blue that I did a video on last year. I've got a 4x12's worth of Marshall Vintages, which are, I guess, technically part of the Vintage 30 line, but they have a different name and a different label on them, so... And I've got my G12 T75, which, uh, is now a corpse. I used this thing as a dummy while I was building the cabinet to like get the screw holes lined up and stuff, make sure that the hole that I jigsawed was the right diameter. It's a real pity that that G12 T75 is no longer functioning. When it was functioning, it was probably the most unique speaker that I owned. It failed when the microphone that was on my stand recording it slipped and rammed into the speaker cone. As a matter of fact, I was recording at the moment when the stand slipped. So, uh, captured on audio was the exact moment that the thing got busted. You hear that sound? It's like, it's like an angel losing its wings. Take a swig for the dead T-75. Rest in peace, my friend. So the speaker was free. As far as connecting the speaker wire to the speaker and the input jack, uh, I relied on a couple of methods. First, just to make sure the thing worked, uh, I did the extremely dodgy method of just twisting the wires around a uh, proper speaker cable real good. Don't try this at home, kids. And once I was sure that that worked and my parts arrived from DigiKey, I moved over to my abysmal soldering skills and a couple of alligator clips instead of those, you know, proper speaker terminal connectors. I couldn't find those on DigiKey. Maybe I just didn't know what to look for. So yeah, alligator clips connect the speaker wires from the input jack to the speaker itself. Very dodgy setup by professional standards. Of course, you know, the cabinet hides the pain, but underneath is work that professional people who know what they're doing would probably have an aneurysm uh, upon witnessing it. Don't tell Psionic Audio about this channel, okay? I'm pretty sure you put out a hit on me or something. Well, the cabinet was now fully assembled, and the first recording that I made with it was with the blue speaker in it. Pretty typical setup for me. I had the SM57 recording it, uh, aimed at the center of the dust cap, backed off to a uh, distance of about six inches from the speaker proper. And I listened to the recording and I thought it sounded pretty good. Of course, one speaker, one recording isn't going to tell me everything. And that brings us to the third reason and most obvious reason why I did this. And that's because I wanted a unique sound. There's a YouTube hero of mine, Jim Lil, who has done extensive tests and documented them in a YouTube video of his own 
about the impact of cabinet construction on the sound that comes out. And from the data that he presented in that video, uh, I was able to make some key choices in the construction of my own cabinet. I wanted it to be a 1x12 because I didn't have a 1x12 already, and I wanted something that was a little bit more portable than a 2x12 or, God forbid, one of my cumbersome 4x12s. But at the same time, I wanted some good bass response, bass response that like wasn't overly muddy or congested, and I also didn't want the, the honk that is often associated with small cabinets and or speakers, if you will. So that influenced my decision to make the cabinet a lot deeper and wider than most 1x12s that you see are. I made it wide enough so that you could put a full-size tube head on top of it, and uh, it would hold the entire thing and there wouldn't be anything dangling off either end. And I also made it pretty deep. Uh, the purpose of this was to make sure the bass response stayed pretty tight, despite the cabinet being small. A thing that I learned from Jim Lil's video is uh, the smaller the cab gets, the more the bass response kind of shifts from the sub-regions, and it starts getting into the more congested high bass regions. So those were the things that I kept in mind when I built the cabinet. But how am I to know now that the experiment and the design choices were a success? Well, I had to do my least favorite part of making these videos, which is making comparisons. Seriously though, do, do you know how, how long com making these comparisons takes? Like in order to swap out like five or six different speakers out of different cabinets and then put them all back, and record them, making sure I put the mic in the same place every time, play the same thing through it every time. I, I, I can eat up a whole night doing that. Like, I, I won't get to bed by like 1 in the morning, and I gotta be at work by 8 in the morning the next day. Ugh, the things I do for YouTube. But hey, this is my life, and I, I couldn't live without this stuff in my life, so... Uh, the expense of my own well-being, I continue to do it. So the first thing I did was drop a bunch of speakers into the new cabinet and see what they sounded like. I'm just gonna play those clips for you real quick. <laughs> So all those speakers behaved as I expected them to do, uh, after me living with them for quite some time and being accustomed to this point at what they will do to what I feed into them. Nothing seemed too out of the ordinary. I mean, I was I was getting what I wanted from the cabinet. You know, I was I was getting a pretty tight bass response. I wasn't getting anything annoyingly honky in the mid-range or anything congested sounding in the high bass. But I still didn't know what this cabinet was doing to the sound compared to my other cabinets. So I decided to do something that I've never done before, and that's take measurements. So I downloaded a copy of Room EQ Wizard, uh, dropped it onto my laptop, and fed the sweep tones that Room EQ Wizard generates through the power amp of my Marshall Valve State, because it's a solid state power amp and therefore less susceptible to distortion than the tube power amp of my 6505 is. I recorded everything with one of my SM81s. Um, I backed it off to a distance of six inches from the speaker every time. I measured it precisely with a ruler every time too. Aimed it at the center of the speaker. So uh, every time the microphone, I was making doubly sure that it was in the same space on the speaker at every time. The only thing that was changing was the cabinet in which the speaker was placed. And of course I was using the same speaker. I was using one of the vintage 30s from my Mesa cabinet. 
I tested four different cabinets. I put the speaker in the new 1x12, I put it in the cheap-ass Harley Benton 2x12 that I have, and then I put it in my big cabs, the Marshall 4x12, and then finally back in the Mesa 4x12. And the recordings and the measurements that I got were very interesting indeed. Also, you know, of course it's worth mentioning in case it wasn't already obvious that, you know, for all of the tests, all the speaker comparisons, all of the cabinet measurements that I've been doing, uh, the mic position has been matched, the amp settings have not been changed, uh, nothing about the setup has been changed except the speaker type and or location of the speaker. <laughs> Of course, there was some expected behavior. You'll notice that the 1x12 has the least base of all the cabinets. I'm going to call your attention to the differences in the base responses of all the cabinets for a minute. The peak in the lows of the 1x12 is actually fairly focused towards the lower end of the base spectrum. It's focused considerably lower than the base peak of the Marshall 4x12, which, I mean, holy crap, that thing's like at 150. Definitely getting into some nasty muddiness territory there. Heck, the base peak on the 1x12 is even a little bit lower than where it is on the 2x12. The Mesa 4x12 has a weirdly irregular base response when compared to the other three cabinets, as well as that really strange notch around 250 hertz. I have no idea what that's all about. It's very strange indeed. Um, but I think I remember commenting on the oddities of the frequency response of the Mesa cabinet back in my original video on the Mesa cabinet, uh, just because I could hear with my ear what the quirks and frequency response were. But what I'm trying to get to is uh, the only other cabinet that has uh, the base peaks location in a place that's uh, about the same as the 1x12s is the Mesa cabinet. So as far as being focused in the low end down to the low end of the spectrum, as far as it can possibly go, uh, I think the 1x12 achieved that goal when compared to the other cabinets. Now, talking about the mid-range, if what we want is a stereotypically mix-ready uh, guitar tone, as will be described to you by other denizens of metal recording YouTube, I'd say that the 1x12 has its heart in the right place, too. Uh, it's got that big dip that uh, ends around uh, 450 hertz, which, uh, according to the words of one YouTuber, I think it was Cola Keller Studio, is the enemy of anything metal. Of course, you know, if you know me, I don't put much stock in the notion that everything has to be moved towards this, you know, mix-ready ideal. I believe you can make any guitar tone you want uh, work in a mix as, you know, as long as it fits your aesthetic that you're going for. But I'm just saying, if that mix-ready ideal is what you want, then uh, as far as mid-range goes, it appears that the 1x12 would help you. The 2x12's dip comes in at almost 100 hertz higher, which is uh, kind of remarkable. We're getting more bass with the peak at a higher frequency, and uh, our mid cut is at a higher frequency uh, than 450 hertz. On two counts so far, I think the 1x12 is beating out the 2x12. The Marshall is way muddier. It's got pretty much uh, everything boosted down in the low mids, as well as having its dip in the mids at a uh, similar frequency as the 2x12 has. And finally, the Mesa. Mesa's gotta be smoking something funny with their cabs. They've got that weird dip at like 250 hertz. They've got that irregular bass response, but somehow, even for a 4x12, their cabinet is pretty bright. I mean, it's, it's got to be an industry standard for a reason, right? Or maybe it just came along first and was associated 
with a type of amplifier that was readily available in the 90s and brought a ridiculous amount of distortion to a growing base of guitar players who needed a ridiculous amount of distortion to compete with the type of music that was happening at the time. One of these days I'm going to do a full video about Mesa stuff because I find the legacy and impact that Mesa has had on the guitar world to be a very interesting one, and not interesting in the same way that a lot of other people in my field find Mesa to be. But you know, that's for another time. Down the road, uh, when I have uh, enough money to be able to afford Mesa's prices, or borrow one of their amplifiers from somebody who already owns one, uh, you'll be the first to know when I achieve either of those goals. But now, the question that you probably all are wondering, how does it sound with a full band behind it? Well, I did a jam with bass, drums, and guitars. Three guitar tracks, uh, one left, one center, and one right. No EQ has been used on the guitar tracks in this upcoming jam. Yeah, I thought this jam turned out pretty good. Uh, it's the first jam that I've done for a demo video where I've actually recorded live drums. Excuse my abysmal drumming skills. I always remember uh, with these videos that I am a studio person first and a musician distant second. Me playing instruments for these videos is a necessary evil. Also, for all these tone tests, I busted out the valve state. I feel like I haven't been giving it enough love ever since I got it, and I felt that it should be given a little bit of a spotlight in this video. So all the speaker comparison and cab comparison tones that you're hearing are valve state. Pretty much everything else is 6505. I think that jam turned out pretty well. Uh, guitar tones sounded pretty good. <laughs> And it sounded pretty good without me having to screw around with it too much in post. You know, again, no EQ, just some level adjustments, some panning, and ba-bam. I had a mix-ready sound, as it were, and I dropped it into a track, and it worked. The 2003 Vintage 30 was the speaker that I put in the cab for that recording, because that is my reference speaker, and I know that whatever I play out of that thing... Generally speaking, no matter what cabinet it's in, no matter what amplifier I'm using, is bound to sound pretty alright. So, cab building project. Was it a success? Yes. Yes, I think it was. I think I gained some valuable experience uh, from this experiment. I learned how to measure stuff. Uh, I learned what my different cabinets are doing to the sound precisely. Like, now I have visual data as well as sound data to back it up. And uh, I've developed a little bit of a skill set that I can apply to future cabinet builds. Uh, cabinet builds that hopefully will not be as janky and first draft as this one is. But hey, again, I, well, I, I just said first draft. Uh, this was my first time doing it. And I managed to create something that's not a complete dumpster fire. Rather, uh, it manages to suit my, my needs and wants. Uh, I wanted a cabinet that... Uh, had good bass response, that had uh, a good mid-range, and that was portable, yet large enough 
to fit one of my full-size amps on top of it conveniently. And that goal has been accomplished. So yeah, uh, that's it. This is my first video that I'm uploading to the new channel. This is going to be pretty much a music exclusive channel. All the subscribers that I'm going to gain here are, I'm uh, hopefully I'm going to gain them organically. Unlike my other main channel whose subscriber count has been artificially inflated by Doom soundtrack related material. So whatever audience I managed to build up here hopefully will be just people who want to see the recording stuff and the music stuff. So yeah, all the normal YouTube stuff, you know, if you liked what you saw, then subscribe and like the video and do all the things that push it into the algorithm, or so I've been told. Sometimes I wonder if the YouTube algorithm is really real. Like, it, are, are all the tricks that people tell you to do, like, they, they tell you to ring the bell, they tell you to, to comment and like and subscribe, like, how much does that really help in the end? Like, I've, I've seen videos and creators on every platform on the internet that seemingly do everything right, yet they go absolutely nowhere. You know, I'm, is it just a lottery? Like, how, how does this work? Is, is there a way to game the system? Is there a way to do it right? Uh, I, I have no idea. My, my heart is leaning towards saying no. But we shall see. We shall see. Stay tuned in the future for more videos like these, uh, more hobbyist recording stuff, maybe some general commentary on music stuff if I manage to collect my thoughts well enough. See you later, everybody. And uh, in the meantime, make sure you take care of yourselves.